Aloha, everyone. Uh, welcome back to those of you who have been with us um, previously, and a warm welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time. Uh, this is our fourth and last session with Dr. Ron Williams, um, a historian and archivist, and he'll tell you a little bit more about himself when he starts. So having said that, um, I am very happy to say that uh, Kahumanu Naiole is with us again uh, this week to offer the pule. Um, he is from Kamehameha Schools, Bishop Memorial Chapel, and also from Kalihi Moanalua Church. Mahalo. Uh, let us pray. Pule kako. Gracious God, we thank you that um, on this Sabbath day, this day that you have given us to rest, uh, that you've helped us carve out time, Lord, just to get to learn more. Um, and to get to be diligent uh, towards understanding and knowing our history. Uh, and as we uh, talk about the past, Lord, and as we set our eyes on the future, we pray that uh, the things that have happened in the past, uh, that it can inform the decisions we make in the future, Lord. Can we make more loving, more kind, more gentle, um, more pleasing decisions, Lord, with one another uh, and with you. Uh, Lord, we're so grateful and thankful uh, for the ways that you continue to bless us. Okay, aloha mai kako. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, my name is Ron Williams, Jr. Um, a little brief, uh, my mother is Janet Marie Labalti. Her people come from Chicago, Illinois, which is where I was born. Uh, before that, they come back from Montreal and um, Paris, uh, Wales, England, Scotland, and Ireland, um, and Czechoslovakia. My father is Ron Williams Sr. Uh, he's Big Ron. Uh, he lives in uh, Arkansas, which is where I grew up. He's a hunter, fisherman, uh, about a seventh or eighth generation farmer uh, living in Arkansas. Um, so that's who I am. That's who my family is. Um, I want to thank the, the AHEC and UCC for the opportunity to share research with you folks. Um, as Kahu said in his beautiful prayer, um, hopefully this acts as a, as a way for us to move forward um, with enlightenment and moving forward with grace and moving forward with kindness and those types of things, um, better knowing the past. Okay, so uh, in the last few weeks, we've talked quite a bit about um, the involvement of the Sons of the Mission in uh, the coup of 1887 and the overthrow of 1893. Um, we've shown primary source documents uh, kind of laying out um, where it came from and who was involved. Um, so there's, there's, I, I think there's very little question among any historian today um, about the, the, uh, the, the church's role in the overthrow. Um, what I want to talk about today is the legacy of that foundation that the Sons of the Mission built. Um, we talked last week about the fact that uh, despite a generalization of the United States as you know the evil empire at the time. Um, there were quite a few people in the United States who were opposed to the annexation of Hawaii. There were quite a few people who were saying it was unjust, that it was not a righteous thing to do. Um, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> and so um, the sons of the mission and and others who were who had done this had to come up with some kind of argument to the United States of why democracy shouldn't prevail in Hawaii. Um, America was, uh, was supposedly about of the people, by the people, and for the people. So to make that argument, uh, the Sons of the Mission had to erase a hundred years of Hawaiian history because we had seen that Hawaiian kingdom run by natives, run by Kanaka Oiwi, built build one of the most progressive modern nations on earth. We talked quite a bit about full literacy. We talked about uh, universal manhood suffrage long before the United States and so forth. And so they've got this record, this history of of not only Christianity uh, being recognized by Boston and everyone else, uh, but also of, of righteous ruling. Uh, and so you've got to get rid of that. You've got to create a new narrative of not only that nation, but of the people. Because now you're asking the United States to take these people in uh, and so forth. And uh, you've got to, to convince the United States why there shouldn't be a vote here. Uh, and that's when that kind of um, vociferous racism and so forth uh, showed its its ugly head uh, because they had to make the argument that Hawaiians weren't equal to Americans and weren't really people. So we talked a little bit about that last week. 
what I'm going to do is move forward from 1900 uh, uh, in today's um, talk and get us hopefully up to today, present day. I'm going to show you some examples of that mo'ukuauhau, of that genealogy of racism, of that genealogy of white supremacy and so forth that was laid the foundation of in 1887 and 1893. And these case studies are, are, are a few that I can fit in in this talk. Uh, I can promise you there are dozens and dozens. <clears throat> Anybody who's heard me talk over the years uh, ho hopefully has seen uh, many more. So let's get started. The American Protestant Mission to the Hawaiian Islands, Moku, uh, Mokuna Eha, part four, Kavama Mua Kavama Hope. In the past is the future. This is the idea that we need to understand the past. It's what guides us, it's what enlightens us, it was what gives us ike about what has happened so we can make good decisions about the future, okay? So the creation of an imposition of a false identity, uh, what we're talking about now is not so much the legal framework of, of what, of occupation and of uh, overthrow and of a coup and so forth. We're talking about the narrative of creating an identity for a people and a person, individual persons. How did that affect Hawaiian Kanaka Oivi moving forward, the people of this land? Um, so we talk about a people and a nation. Lahui Hawaii. What is the Lahui Hawaii? What is the nation of Hawaii? I, I would not hesitate, even though I am, <laughs> I would not hesitate to say 15, 20 years ago uh, that very few people had a good understanding of the glory of the 19th century Hawaiian kingdom. Uh, when I started teaching in Hawaiian studies, there was still this belief that um, the annexation had brought progress to Hawaii, that uh, Hawaiians were kind of behind and, and the, gen, you know, the, the generation of people understand, thinking that Hawaiians were not as smart and not as capable and so forth was, was still there. Um, so that narrative is what we're gonna look at. Also, what is a native Hawaiian? Um, so again, that, that idea of identity, and not only identity, but self-identity. This is one of the most important things in my mind. Um, again, I, I mahalo the, the political scientists who are pushing uh, the legal uh, arguments about getting land back, about getting a nation back, and those types of things. Um, but I would argue it's just as important, if not more important, for a people to get their identity back, to understand who they are and where they came from. When I was in college, uh, one of my heroes was Nelson Mandela. Um, I'm old enough to, to have been in college when he was still in prison. Uh, and I had such an, an, an incredible, um, you know, uh, uh, um, positive outlook about him. And I, and I thought, here's a man, here's an African who knows his worth. Uh, if there's anybody out there that knows his worth, it's Nelson Mandela. And so once he was released and uh, he issued his autobiography, I read that and, and, and quickly ate it up. And I came across a part that I'm gonna to read to you today uh, that talks about that idea of self-identity. When he was in the ANC and they were traveling around kind of uh, as uh, rebels, uh, blowing up you know, electricity grids and things like that, he was hiding out and he was having to travel from nation to nation by small plane. And he writes about one of those incidents here. And he says, we put down briefly in Khartoum where we changed to an Ethiopian Airways flight to Addis. Here, I experienced a rather strange sensation. As I was boarding the plane, I saw that the pilot was black. I had never seen a black pilot before, and the instant I did, I had to quell my panic. How could a black man fly an airplane? But a moment later, I caught myself. I had fallen into the apartheid mindset, thinking Africans were inferior and that flying was a white man's job. Now that's Nelson Mandela questioning the idea of a black man flying a plane. So if we underestimate the power of the creation of a master narrative that puts down a people and takes away their, their history, um, we only have to turn to that example. So let me give you some Hawaiian examples. We talked last week about uh, W.D. Alexander, um, William DeWitt Alexander, the mission son, uh, two-time president of the Hawaiian Mission Children's Society and an annexation commissioner to the US. His creation of a brief history of the Hawaiian people, the book that said, Two thirds of native Hawaiian children were buried alive in their front yard by their parents because they were too lazy to raise kids. We talked about how that became uh, the school textbook for all private and public schools in Hawaii for 40 years. That's the foundation uh, that we're gonna look, look at that, that produces uh, the incidents we're gonna see today. Um, so when we move into 1900, we talk about the creation of a territory of Hawaii. 
And we start to see that kind of finagling to where America wants to bring Hawaiians into the nation to, to own the property, but they don't want to make Hawaiians full citizens because they're brown folks. Um, and so they make them a territory. Now, if you look at the record throughout that pro-annexation rhetoric in the 1896, 97, 98 period, uh, they were promising that Hawaiians would come in as a state. Uh, now, we, we, we look at that today as we want neither, <laughs> but at that time, uh, to be taken into the United States as a state meant at least you'd have full citizenship. What, was happened, what happened by making it a territory was that two thirds of the government in Hawaii was still controlled by appointment, not by the elector, electorate. And so that kept, kept a hold on native Hawaiians, on Chinese, on Japanese and other races in Hawaii. So that creation of, a ter of territorial law in Hawaii in 1900 was done by the Organic Acts. The Organic Acts was, were put together by a commission of five men, two from Hawaii and three from the United States, appointed by the President of the United States. And the, the, the chair of that commission was this gentleman, Senator John Tyler Morgan. Uh, Senator Morgan had also created the, what's known as the Morgan Report, which was a blatantly one-sided report that tried to rebuff the Blount Report. Uh, he had talked to people only on uh, the, the annexationist side and kind of put out this false report. And, and it wasn't taken that seriously at the time. Uh, but nonetheless, he's appointed to be the commissioner of the, uh, of the, of the Organic Acts Commission. Uh, and what we need to do, one, besides looking at the, the details of, of that, those acts, are contextualize who this man was in his creation of, of the law for the territory of Hawaii. We find out that besides being chairman of the Hawaiian Organic Act Commission in 1900, he was also the second Grand Dragon of the realm of Alabama, invisible empire of the KKK. Um, now that's not a guess, that's not an assumption, that's not a uh, one piece of proof, that's from a hagiotic, a hagiographic biography produced by wives of the KKK who glorified his role and others and talked about uh, the role they played. Uh, Morgan would later on in his, in his, in his, um, in his duty in, in Congress uh, admit to that he'd gotten away with this and no one really knew. Um, but again, uh, if we look at the actual authentic history of the Ku Klux Klan written by Susan Lauren Davis, Lawrence Davis, she says to my mother, Sarah Ann Davis and other Southern women who designed and, ma and manufactured with their own fingers, the regalia for the Ku Klux Klansmen and the trappings for their horses and to the Ku Klux Klan 1865 to 1877, both the living and the dead, this history is gratefully dedicated. And she has a whole chapter on uh, John Tyler Morgan. Um, so when we talk about, uh, when we have these discussions, when we have these debates today about the creation of law in Hawaii in 1900, about the creation of the framework of the territory of Hawaii, we must understand that the chairman of that committee was also a, a grand dragon of the KKK. So that, that starts to give us an understanding of, 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 the, of, again, the framework and how it moves forward. In 1907, we have the renaming of Honolulu High School. Uh, Sanford Dole, who had been governor, who now was a federal judge, led this push to rename the most, the, the, the largest school in Honolulu, uh, from Honolulu High School. Uh, they changed it to President William McKinley High School in honor of the president who had supposedly annexed Hawaii in 1898. So what I want to talk about in, in this kind of section is not so much the specific, you know, renaming of this school, the, the, the atrocity that, that naming the school was, but that larger idea of claiming space on the physical landscape of Hawaii and in the minds of Kanaka Oivi and others. The fact that that's one of the first things you do, Dr. Trask used to talk about this quite a bit. She talked about imperialism and colonialism and how it's been perfected over the years. Uh, and in this process, one of the first things you do is claim space. That's why you hang your flags everywhere. That's why you build statues and so forth. And so Sanford Dole gets the ball rolling with this 1907 renaming of Honolulu High School that becomes the renaming of schools and the naming of new schools throughout the islands to a point where we have 37, oops, where we have 37 schools across the islands named after US presidents and military men and also heroes. Um, now, if you think about that in a, in a nonpartisan idea, if you're coming at it from a, an angle where you're like, okay, well, so, so let's see the mere fact that this island these, this group of islands is 5,000 miles from the United States, it makes you start to wonder why uh, the, the schools carry the names of, of those different people and why there are no, not 
supposedly any native heroes, any native educators, any native people from that glorious past that are used to name the schools at, the, at, the, at these present times. So throughout 1907 through the 19 teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, uh, we start to see a claiming of space by the United States and by, by, um, by the, the sons of the mission and others that were the, now the grandsons and others that had, had done well in business here are naming those spaces after uh, Americans. Um, one of the many examples of that indoctrination, of that taking Hawaiians away from their, back, their history. Now, we talked earlier about the 1896 law for the Republic of Hawaii that mandated English as a medium of education in, in all schools. So the fact that from 1896 on, you're seeing Hawaiian, the Hawaiian language uh, play a smaller and smaller role in families, in society, and so forth. Economic and, and social pressures through the 19-teens and 20s will mean uh, many people have, have, have now chosen not to, to follow the instruction of Hawaiian language because you have to get a good job. You have to achieve in this environment and so forth. And so with that kind of um, language uh, push, you're losing, again, that one of the largest indigenous archives of writing in the world from your kapuna, from the grandparents, from the great grandparents and so forth through the 19th century. This is a flag raising exercise at Kula Kapa'a, at Kapa'a School in the Moku or Mokupuni or Kauai, right? So on Kauai Island uh, and all the other islands, you see these flag raising exercises where children, the next generation, is taught that this is who you are. You are an American, you're not a Hawaiian. Um, and so we start to see that kind of become claiming, again, claiming space on the landscape in Kanaka Oivi mines. Um, now, I, I, I say this just from, so we can remember to tie this, this string to an issue that is supposedly why we're all here today, and that is what are our actions today supposed to be? So when we look around our landscape today and we say, what is my kuleana as far as Hawaii is concerned? What is my kuleana as far as Kanaka Oivi are concerned? We remember uh, this legacy. In uh, 1928, um, at McKinley High School, they dedicated a new student auditorium. Uh, it was a gym for basketball and for other things and, 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 and school assemblies and so forth. Uh, and it was a very big occasion. Um, the, it was, uh, the superintendent of public instruction came out. The mayor of Honolulu was there, the president of the PTA, and the president of the student body. All students and parents were required to come and they filled up this new gymnasium. And the, there was an address made by Governor Wallace Ryder Farrington to the, to the uh, crowd. And then the main event of that, uh, of that, of that um, ceremony was conducted. And that was a pageant. Uh, they liked, it was quite a, quite a popular thing in, back in those days where these pageants where you would dress up and play and act out a certain theme or uh, a certain history. And so at this dedication of McKinley School High School Gym in 1928, uh, the event was a racial pageant, and it's, it literally called, it's not my, my name, it's literally called the Racial Pageant, the Making of Americans in Hawaii. Um, so again, creating a new identity for Kanaka Uivi children, not only Kanaka Uivi children, but, but Chinese Hawaiian children, Japanese Hawaiian children, and others. Uh, and so the way this pageant went with uh, all students and parents present was the, was that the chanters and warriors represent old Hawaii. So they had some gentlemen dressed up as chanters uh, and, and koa and warriors, uh, and they chanted and acted for the crowd. Um, the spirit of Hawaii enters and is received with a chant of welcome. So they have one, someone dressed up representing Hawaii, and they come into the gym, and they're, they're brought in by chant. The spirit of McKinley comes in as a representative of American education in Hawaii. So they have someone dressed up as President McKinley. He comes in and he's representing American education in Hawaii. A Hawaiian child is brought forward by its mother and accepted by the spirit of McKinley. So they literally have a parent at the school bring forth their child and hand their child off to McKinley. From the door of McKinley School comes a band of various racial groups. And one by one, they bring their children up to McKinley and hand them off to the president of the United States. They are the young Americans of Hawaii. They sing the McKinley alma mater. The spirit of America appears and all sing the Star Spangled Banner. 
So they have someone dressed up as America and he, he or she comes in and they, stay, and they sing the Star Spangled Banner. The audience is requested to join in the singing of the Star Spangled Banner. So you see these um, very kind of blunt, uh, over the top kind of uh, recreation of a people's identity. Um, we are grateful that you've handed off your children to us to educate. Uh, you've done the right thing. Even Hawaii, represented by this single man, uh, agrees with us. So through that period, through the 1930s and, and 40s and so, so forth, you see this uh, indoctrination, you see this inculcation of the idea that there is one flag, that you're not a mixed identity, that there's one nation, one flag, uh, and that you should speak American. Um, it says loyal Americans speak American, the one language for us all. And this turns into curriculum and this turns into pageants and this turns into things throughout the Department of Education. Um, in the 1926, the, the newspaper, The Opinion, uh, sponsored a grammar contest, uh, an English grammar contest. And it was called, and it was, uh, the event was called Better English Week. Uh, and they asked, have you formed a new resolution for the rest of your life? that you will speak and write nothing but good English. Um, and that again, uh, kind of not only leads people to this new identity and new path, but really makes it clear that the past is not only past, but is not as equal, not as worthy. Um, at McKinley High School during this week, they had a better English parade. This is a kind of a shady newspaper, uh, kind of a hard to see newspaper. Um, on the top left, you have McKinley weds good English. So a representative of McKinley High School was married to good English. Um, on the bottom, you have king and queen of good English on parade. On the top right, you have the faculty, judges, and spectators of good English. And on the bottom right, you have a burial of pigeon English. Um, I was part of a group for, that wrote uh, pieces for statehood in, 19, in 2009 for the 50th anniversary of statehood. And one of the writers that was with me talked about his mother's, I think it was his mother, might've been his grandmother, her attendance at this, she was a McKinley High School student. She remembers when they had a funeral for Pigeon at the school and they literally buried Pigeon. They literally buried something that they, just, that they represented it as Pigeon. Um, but, the, you know, but these might even be a little bit, um, there might be a kind of a comical, note to some of these, but it, but it was a, you know, it, it, I really want to emphasize how serious it was and how transforming it was. If, and, and, and how, again, blunt the message was. If you look at the next one, uh, during the 1930s and 40s and 50s, and remember the Massey case uh, had really kind of re-signified or re-characterized Hawaiians as these brutes who couldn't control their emotions and so forth. Um, that was used during lying Better English Week they had a trial for the murder of Miss Good English at McKinley High School. They had a mock trial for the murder of Miss Good English. And the narrative about her murder was this, Miss Good English was asleep in her home when at midnight, the murderer came through her window and stabbed her through the heart. Miss Good English, as she was being stabbed, gave a long shriek. And it's really, you know, setting in the minds of these children I mean, what do you think, who do you think murdered good English? It was, of course, Pigeon or Hawaiian or, or somebody in that realm had murdered Miss Good English um, and was now on trial. Um, so we have these types of representations, these types of, of curriculum uh, going to the students of, of Hawaii. Um, moving forward to 1931, around the same period when I was doing a, some research on John Henry Wise, the native Hawaiian football player a few, dec few years ago, uh, I came across his uh, photos in the UH yearbook. So UH, the University of Hawaii at Manoa had a yearbook similar to high school yearbooks. You, you, you got them every year and you took them home and had your parents sign them, your friends sign them, your sisters and brothers and passed them around and, and we're really proud of your photo in there and so forth or not. <laughs> and um, the University of Hawaii yearbook in 1931 was called Kapala Pala. And it was in 1931, it was, it was interesting because it was set out like a history of Hawaii. Uh, they, had the over, they, had, they had different, you know, here's the history of Kamehameha I, here's this, and they had pictures of the students in between. And so I was curious to see what they would say about the overthrow, uh, and they labeled that um, section uh, the transition, 1890 to 1899. 
Uh, and in that place, in that section of the UH Manoa yearbook, uh, they said this, this period reveals the islands on the verge of dynamic changes. Queen Liliuokalani was on the throne and had ruled despotically, bringing about the changes of changes without consulting the will of her people. Revolution soon followed and her throne was seized from her. Okay. So this was the official yearbook of the University of Hawaii uh, that every student took home that, and, and passed around and so forth. This was the master narrative by 1931, that the reason for the overthrow was the queen was being despotic in pushing her ego for a new constitution, which is absolutely untrue. And we've proven that you know false in, in a number of different ways. I'll show you one here. Um, these are pala pala ho'opi'i, these are petitions, yalili ukalani, tu lili ukalani, on her trip when she traveled around the islands when she became queen. A traditional circuit of the islands was, was, uh, was, a tra was traditional throughout Hawaiian history, and the queen uh, took it up passionately. She wanted to hear what her people wanted. And so in her first few months of queen, as queen, she started out at Kalaupapa and then traveled around the islands, going to the schools, talking to the parents, talking to every people in the community. And at every stop, she was handed these literal, you see them in front of you, these petitions, these paper petitions that were created by Hui Kalai Aina, the political group from 1887. Not only, and they were demanding a new constitution of the queen. They say, hey, kumu kanavai ho, a new constitution for our land and for our nation. So besides these petitions, in 1892, you'll see 65 other petitions come into the legislature from different towns of Wound, Hawaii, demanding a new constitution of the queen. So what she was doing was listening to her constituents and following what they wanted. She says in her own book, this was the voice of people. This was the voice of the people, which, as we know, is the voice of God. And so it wasn't about her having an ego. It wasn't about her pushing a new constitution because she wanted power. It was, be, it was her listening to the voices of her people. Yet we see a completely different narrative from the University of Hawaii at Manoa in 1931. Uh, in 2001, uh, I was a, a freshman in college at the University of, at, at Maui Community College. And my kumu, my uh, Kiopia Raymond had brought into class this magazine. Uh, it was Honolulu Magazine, which they say has over 100,000 affluent readers. Um, and it had been around since the time of Kalakaua. Uh, and now it's, it's, it's Honolulu Magazine. It's still around. And they ran a cover story called The Myth of Ohana. Now, their, their cultural editor at the magazine was a man named Scott Whitney, who was a non-Hawaiian who had a, a master's degree in Pacific Island Studies. Uh, and he wrote this column. And at that time, you have to put it in context. This was during the trask Linican debates and all these ideas, you know, just kind of coming out of the, 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 the meat of the Hawaiian Renaissance and Hawaiians starting to claim their, their, their history. Um, and Jocelyn Linican had written about how, well, a lot of it's made up and I'm not sure they really know what they're talking about and so forth. Dr. Trask had written back and said, who are you to say we don't know what we're talking about? And so Scott Whitney had this idea that he wanted to prove. And so he went and did a tiny bit of, of awful research. And he produced this central story, this cover story in one of the major magazines of Hawaii called The Myth of Ohana. And he said this, everyone thinks the word Ohana expresses an ancient Hawaiian value. Not so, it turns out we made it up. Now, my first question is who's we? Um, but my second question is, wow, really? I, and, and you see the photo with the article, right? A really degrading photo about Hawaiians and saying they don't even know who they are. You know, they're they're talking about and he he came out of this with the you know talking about the project uh, Kaholawe on, yeah, and how and the idea was that that Hawaiians were making up history and culture uh, for political purposes, and so he wants to prove that. So he apparently says he does. He says it's, it's a made up word. And his proof is this: look in one of the original Hawaiian language dictionaries. Lauren Andrews, 1865 tome with a snappy title, a dictionary of the Hawaiian language to which is appended, blah, 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 blah. You will not find a listing for the word Ohana. Now that, that was surprising. As we're sitting in class in 2001 in Kiopi's class, Kumu Kiopi's class, you know, I, I didn't believe what he's saying at all, but that's interesting. Why, if it's such a central part of culture, why wouldn't it be in the 1865 dictionary? Um, so, so we are, you know, having a little doubt. Those folks who had been talking about this the whole time and who, who had thought Hawaiians were making up stuff, now they're telling all their friends, see, I told you, this is da 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 da, -da. Well, it turns out he was wrong. Um, about five months later, uh, he 
publishes a retraction in the back of the magazine on a page like 72, about this long. Uh, and he says what had happened. And he says this. Now, remember, this is the cultural editor of a major magazine in Hawaii. This is the, the ease with which Hawaiians can be, identity can be created for them by others, even in, the, even in 2001. And he says this, in researching the original article, I phoned the Hawaii State Library's Hawaiian Pacific, Hawaii Pacific Collection and asked the librarian to look up the word ohana for me in the 1865 Andrews Dictionary. He looked there and told me over the phone that the word was not there. There's not even any O's in here, he mumbled under his breath. I should have stopped right there to follow up, <laughs> you think so? But I was happy to be proved right that I hung up and went on with my writing. So he phone called the library and asked them to see if it was in a book. Journalism 101, you know, we folks know better than that, right? You check the sources yourself, you get multiple sources. But yet he had, a, he had something to prove. And so he took this phone call and wrote this article that questioned Hawaiians' understanding of who they were. Now, anyone who knows that 1865 dictionary, Hawaiian language students will know that those, that dictionary is alphabetized by vowels and then consonants. So you see A, E, I, O, U, Hey, Kayla, Mu, Nu, so forth and so forth. So if you look after N, no, you're not going to see the O's. You're going to see the P's. That's what had happened. The, the librarian had literally even told him there's no O's in the dictionary. And he closed, hung up the phone, and wrote this story. So these are some of the sources that I pulled that would have disproven at the time he had access to these. Hawaiian language newspapers had thousands and thousands and thousands of incidents of Ohana in their papers prior to the 1870s. Kumu ke kumu apuni, ke apuni mo'i, by Bala Hemolele, the Hawaiian Bible. Any of these sources could have shown him that the word of Ohana, Ohana wasn't created in the 1950s and so forth. Um, yet again, speaks to this underlying institutional racism that seeks to, to tell Hawaiians who they are. This moves forward uh, into today. Uh, actually, this is from 2004. 13, I believe, uh, the chancellor at the university, I forget who it was at the time, we can go through them so fast, um, but the chancellor had asked the uh, departments at UH to each put out a history of their department. The idea was to create a, a, an official um, academic history of the University of Hawaii. And so most of the departments ignored him like they usually do, <laughs> but the College of Ag uh, tropical Ag took it up in, in with, with passion because that's where we all came from. The, we were a land grant, grant college that was originally a Bureau of Tropical Agriculture and Forestry. It became a land grant college that became UH. So our Mo'oku Alhau at UH all comes from the School of Tropical Ag. So, they're like, so they were proud of it. So they're going to write the history of their, de their department at least. And so they do. Uh, they hire two professional editors. Uh, it's published by UH Press. And they put out this beautiful coffee table book that $60, $70, and they talk about the history of, you know, of UH. And in that book, uh, they say this. On January 4th, the Hawaii Bureau, later Board of Agriculture and Forestry, was established in the Republic of Hawaii, also established in 1893. I'll pause for the, all the historians out there to, to, to jump. Um, the Republic of Hawaii, run by these gentlemen below, did not exist until the 4th of July, 1894. Um, that's something that you literally can find on Wikipedia. That's something that uh, whether or not you're into Hawaiian history or so forth, you could have looked up on the internet and seen in a thousand places. The Republic of Hawaii was created on the 4th of July, 1894. January 4th, 1893 was before the overthrow. Now, I'm gonna show you proof of that being wrong, but before I do, I wanna to talk to you about the fact that, so. Why did they do this? How did that mistake happen? I, I don't think they were malicious in thinking that we're gonna to try to sneak this by because it's too easily proven wrong. I mean, it's too, again, most people know that's false. You could prove it wrong in five minutes by looking at Wikipedia. I think it again, speaks to that institutional racism that comes from the erasure of Hawaiian history and a Hawaiian nation and a Hawaiian people that were some of the most brilliant and progressive people and nations of the 19th century. We've gotten rid of that. We've created a whole new identity for Hawaiians to where in the point in 2013, you're able to get away with writing this um, and for seven years. I, I discovered this when I was working at the uh, Native Hawaiian Student Services Center. We talked to the chancellor, they changed the online version 
but the physical books are still out there. But so let's look at the actual, so, you know, I just said, so well, let's go to the archives and pull that actual bill and see what it is. 1892 Hawaiian Kingdom Legislature, in the 18th day, an act to establish a college in the kingdom was put forward by Luther William P. Punonua Kanealii from Maui. So a Maui legislator put forth this bill to create a college in the kingdom. That had, that, that mushed together with a, like often happens in legislature, with a bill to create a Bureau of Agriculture and Forestry. Here's the actual bill, bill number 14. And it was introduced by the Minister of the Interior. Here's the second reading, here's the third reading, there's where it passes. And on the fourth day of January, 1893, that bill to create a Bureau of Tropical Agriculture and Forestry is signed into law by Queen Lili Uokalani. There's the newspaper uh, publication. And if that's not enough for you, the primary source the actual physical handwritten bill with her signature is, is here on this slide. Uh, it was published in English and Hawaiian. This is the Hawaiian version. A kanavai, a ho'okumuai, i buru mahiai, a me ulu la'au. A bill to create a Bureau of Tropical Agriculture and Forestry. At the bottom of this page, you see the Queen's signature uh, approved this day, 4, December, 4 January, 1893. There's a citation for it. Very simple to find out where that bill came from and how it happened. Yet that entire history is so easily pushed aside by institutional academia saying, this is what we think. So to finish up, um, you know, I, I, I really want that to sink in, this idea that here we are after all of this, here we are 50 years into the Hawaiian Renaissance, yet this institutional racism is still present enough to create narratives that can be proven wrong in five minutes on Wikipedia. Um, and not Facebook posts and not these, but, but published um, books and published journals. I'm gonna finish up with this idea of today, present day today, um, claiming space on the physical landscape of Hawaii uh, and in the minds of Kanaka Oivi. At Eva Elementary School uh, in Eva, right? Ikamoku o Oahu iko Hawaii pai aina. So in this land of Hawaii, in EVA in 2023, they'll be having their 78th, I believe, maybe 79th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln Day. Um, they have a statue of Abraham Lincoln in front of the school. All of the kids are literally, they purchase t-shirts for them. Uh, Lincoln Elementary School or Lincoln um, Day. They have the kids recite poems. They have a song, I wanna be just like you. Uh, and it begs the question, there's not a Kanaka Oivi that you'd want the students to, to say they want to be like. Uh, there's not a, uh, anyone closer than the 7,000 miles uh, that, that we'd have the school assembly um, sing to, uh, honor, and lay. Um, so I, uh, there's a little video that I want to show you. It's two minutes long. Uh, and I want to share that with you so that we can all kind of get an idea what that looks like. through our lives and it all started here for me at Eva Elementary School. Okay, today we celebrate the 75th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln. We unveiled the statue in 1944 with student performances, which we carry on today. Uh, some of the traditions we have are the reciting of the Gettysburg Address, the Royal Hawaiian Band, 
and a lot of student performance and speeches. Recently, we added the Lincoln Day Essay Contest, and that winning essay was read today. Um, it's always a special day when we have Lincoln Day, whether it's the 75th annual or just um, every year's Lincoln Day is as special as any other. And uh, we thank the parents for supporting us and our faculty and staff for all their hard work. I want to finish off on a, on a up note. Um, and that idea is that we can make a difference in, in this scenario. I mean, that is, um, that is claiming space on the physical landscape and, uh, and, and in people's minds, in students' minds, um, by the thousands, right? And by the generation. Um, so if we think about uh, Kanaka Oivi as a nation and as individual people and how this um, foundation late in 1893 has progressed and, and, and spread out and become a master narrative, then we can start to ask ourselves what our kuleana is in that situation and, and, what, and what we uh, uh, should do. One thing we can do is, is to uncover this history and talk about it and create uh, a, a new space. Um, one of my favorite writers, uh, an African writer, uh, uh, wrote in his book, um, let me, let me pull up here, here, Ben Okri, A Way of Being, he said this, in a fractured age, when cynicism is God, here is a possible heresy. We live by stories, we also live in them. One way or another, we are living the stories planted in us early or along the way, or we are, living all, we are also living the stories we planted, knowingly or unknowingly in ourselves. We live stories that either give our lives meaning or negate it with meaninglessness. If we change the stories we live by, quite possibly we can change our lives. Mahalo. Mahalo Kumran. This is the, the last of the four excellent presentations that uh, Kumran has shared with us. So if you have any questions about today or even probably previous things, please feel free to put those in the chat and we um, can have some uh, discussion here with him about that. Um, well, to start Kumran, I was um, wondering you know, in light of what you just shared and, you know, the master narratives of racism and I think white supremacy being so prevalent today, but also so hidden in a lot of ways, what um, kind of tools or do you think questions we can be asking if we, you know, we're reading the newspaper or we're going to going around our everyday lives, um, but something feels off, like what kind of questions can we be asking? I think one of the, one of the I think one of the central questions is, to start asking ourselves when we hear something about the nation of Hawaii or we see, hear something about Hawaiians or anyone, one of the first questions we ask ourselves is where is that, is, is who's the author of that, of that speech? Uh, and I don't mean who's delivering it. I'm, I'm in a situation where I'm non Kanaka Oivi delivering Hawaiian history, but I see my kuleana as delivering the voices of those people of the past, right? So if, if you hear something, you know, from someone and it's, if you read a book and it, I'll give you an example. There's a book that came out uh, a couple of years ago about Duke Kahanamoku, uh, and it's written by Dan Davis, a, an ESPN sports writer, which doesn't automatically disqualify him from writing it because maybe he speaks fluent Hawaiian and maybe he's accessing Hawaiian sources. We don't know. But so you look into it and you, and you, and you see that, no, he, he doesn't speak a word of Hawaiian. He didn't access Hawaiian language voices. He didn't do anything. So you immediately know here's an outsider not even accessing the plethora of materials that are there about who Duke Kanemoku was as a person seen by his own people. Um, I wrote a review of the book and I, and I talked about the fact that there's hundreds of beautiful letters about Duke in the Hawaiian language newspapers from his people about him. There's a 60 line mele inoa, a name chant written by a woman in Hilo about who he is. And those things aren't included in this guy's biography. So, so that's one of the answers is, is to start to question um, where the material you're reading is coming from. That's great, thank you. Yeah. Um, someone has asked, were there any church or government run boarding schools in Hawaii? Yeah, <laughs> um, lots. Uh, Kamehameha Schools was one. Um, there were lots of others, you know, in, 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 the in the 1880s, 90s, there was Hilo Boarding School, Lahaina Luna, um, lots and lots and lots. Okay. Um, what is the difference between Kanaka Oivi and Kanaka Maui? Uh, there's, well, so we, well, 
we have to be really careful when we use terminology because uh, what I always say and what I was taught is that not all knowledge is, in, is within one halal and there is no right answer. Now there's some, there's some very few examples when there, when there is a right answer, but in general, it depends on, you know, depends on what you're trying to put under that label. Kanaka, to me, Kanaka Uivi and Kanaka Maoli are interchangeable. Uh, Kanaka Uivi and Kanaka Maoli, now, there were some times when, when Kanaka Uivi was used when it meant pure Hawaiian, um, right? Was a, as opposed to where Kanaka Maoli might mean, you know, a Hawaiian mixed with other races and so forth. But then it, you see it used in the same way on the Kanaka Maoli side. Um, so it's a preference issue between using Kanaka Maoli and Kanaka Uivi. Um, my kumu use Kanaka Uivi, and, and that's what I see in the, in the articles that I'm writing and so forth. And so that's what that's why I use Kanaka Uivi. Um, it's different than Kanaka, which can mean man. It's different than Hawaiian. It's different than Native Hawaiian. Um, that's why I feel comfortable using that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, with the history of U, with the history of UH, would that mean that would that mean the school is actually under the Hawaiian Kingdom and not the state of Hawaii? So uh, that's a political question about the status of Hawaii today that I can't answer. I'm not a politician and I'm a historian. I can tell you that there are debates about whether or not uh, the annexation was legal. Um, I don't believe it was, um, but again, I'm not a lawyer. I can't prove that in court. Um, if you if you uh, believe if you know that there was no annexation, then yes, you'd say there's there's still some uh, discrepancy in the status of those places, and those are the arguments that that that, that uh, political scientists and others are having today. Very valid arguments, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm not qualified to to give you a straight answer on that. Got it. Thank you. Um, has the Hawaiian mission houses ever addressed the overthrow, and how have they moved forward writing that wrong? Um, how was it that Japanese language classes were permitted after schools in the public education classrooms, at least in the 60s or earlier, and Hawaiian language emergent schools had to be created for the renewal of Olelo Hawaii? Okay, so I can give you my mana'o on, on the Hawaiian mission houses. I can't, I don't speak for them again, uh, it, you know, to answer the question, I'd, I'd like to have somebody from them here also. Uh, but what I would say, in my opinion, is that um, over the last two decades, the Hawaiian mission houses has uh, made some steps and some efforts towards uh, addressing uh, the whole past, their whole past. Um, I think they've got a long way to go. Uh, and I think they've, they, they need to make um, more significant steps. Uh, but, but I've seen, you know, that they, uh, for what it's worth, and I do think it's worth something, um, they've, they've begun to bring Kanaka Oivi onto their board of trustees. Um, and, and so forth. And so, and, I, and I've been in discussions uh, with some of them that, that show me that there is um, a push, a movement within Hawaiian mission houses to open up and talk about the entire past. But there are some folks who absolutely do not want to. So that's kind of an internal struggle that they, not only they, but almost every institution in Hawaii is having today. I mean, you can, we could, we could, we could you know, it's easy to say mission houses because they're, they're the easy one that comes to mind. We could say the same thing about Kamehameha schools. We could say the same thing about Bishop Museum. We could say the same thing about Hawaii State Archives. We could say the same thing about UH. Um, there are, there's resistance to opening, to Punahou. There's resistance to open up these narratives and say, what's the entire history? Someone has asked, uh, oh, mahalo for the light at the table. Would you be able to recall the role of the church, the church had um, taken part in the inoculating of the people? Yeah. Uh, well, they have, a, they, I believe they have a role in, a direct role in that, I mean, you know, in what came out of uh, post 1900, because we've, we've shown through primary source documents that the, the not only, they weren't only guys who happened to be in the church who did this overthrow. It was the Ahuhui Wanaliu Hawaii Papa Hawaii. It was the board that was organizing that had these narratives that were saying these racist things and so forth. So the church was directly involved in this in these political machinations. We see that the, the, the uh, W. D. Alexander created this book that became a foundation for everything coming out of uh, you know dismissing Hawaiians as people you know from from 1899 on. So there's a very direct connection to the church and there's a very direct connection to uh, that legacy that we end up with today. Um, you know, and, and, and I, don't, I don't have experience with this, but I'll tell you this, my dissertation focused on 1863 to 1900 uh, and my book will, will, will bring in a little bit of the early mission too. But post 1900, I, I know very little about in the churches, 
But I've had those discussions with Dr. Charlot and others who do and others who lived here. And the narrative that has been told to me is that in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, the church was that place that tamped down these discussions. That you went to church and, the, and, and the church, at the church you were told not to talk about these things, that's politics and leave it alone and so forth. So if that's true, then that would be a kuleana that, that also needs to be looked at as far as in the 1880s and 90s, Kanaka Oibi churches were the, were the center of politics. And then they became the place to not talk about that stuff. Okay, um, could you say something about Wallace Ryder Farrington and the role he played in the distortion of the Hawaiian Lee? What was the last word about the distortion uh, of the Hawaiian Lee? Uh, oh. Hawaiian Lee. Okay, yeah, so that's, well, I, again, my period start, my historical period, you know, gets, gets weak after 1900, but, um, but those things I talked about with the, uh, around the 1920s and 30s, he had a direct role in, right, with McKinley High School, with these different narratives that, that are coming out of the Department of Education and so forth. So, you know, as governor, you're you're directly involved in in all of those things. Okay. Did uh, did the word Kanaka Maoli originate from the Maori uh, terminology? I don't know. To be honest with you, I'm not I'm not a linguist, um, and I, I I couldn't say. I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, oops. Can you explain what the recent DOE commitment towards Hawaiian history was all about? Uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not avoiding anything. It's just, I'm, I don't work for the DOE. I, I don't know what they're doing or what they're up to. Um, I, I do, actually, I, that's not true. I do work for the DOE. I have, a, I'm, I have a side contract that every once in a while they call me and ask me stuff, um, but, but I'm not involved enough to know, you know specifics they're working on at the moment. I do know that the DOE created, years ago, created an office of Hawaiian education, OHE, uh, which has some brilliant and wonderful Kanaka Uivi uh, educators and curriculum builders and so forth. So I know that there are parts of the DOE that are working very hard to, to change uh, these master narratives, um, but I, I'm not sure of, of specific plans and so forth. Okay, um, another one related to education. Now that Central Middle School has changed its official name to Ke'ili uh, Ke Kolani, excuse me, do you think other schools will be able to follow that path? I do, and I'm very excited about that because, and I, I think I can say this because I think, I think it's official, is that, um, so, so I'll be honest, when that happened, when I saw the name change, the cynic in me said, oh yeah, great, they changed the name. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna put the name on the wall and, and we're gonna move forward the same, same old stuff. Uh, and then I was called into a meeting with the principal uh, and I, oh man, I wish I could remember his name at the moment. Wonderful man, uh, passionate about uh, place and identity and so those types of things. Uh, and I met with him and, and representatives of the DOE uh, because because of his and the DOE's uh, motivation, uh, we're creating a class, a curriculum class on Ke'eli Kolani that will be required for every student at the school, um, which I think is a huge thing. Um, I mean, so everyone going through Princess Ruth Ke'eli Kolani school will be required to take a class on her. Uh, and that, com that comes from the principal uh, and the DOE. So, I, so this is a real genuine effort uh, to, to push a reevaluation re of that narrative and to push Kanaka weaving narratives and identity and so forth. And so I think that type of thing will get others excited to see, because mm -hmm. what I've come to understand and with the resistance that we're seeing from changing McKinley is that a lot of it has to do with the principal. And mm -hmm. so, so, so when, when you see a principal like this uh, really push uh, um, significant change, um, then I think it gives, it emboldens other principals. So yes, I, I think we will see change. That's excellent. And somebody in the chat, uh, just to give credit where credit's due, I guess the principal is Joseph Passantino. Yes, yes, Passantino. Okay, awesome. Um, when was the textbook written by William DeWitt Alexander stopped being used in public schools? Wasn't there some reflection on this rebranding done at the time? Yes, it, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was the official textbook for 40 years. So 1939, 1940, that school year is when it didn't, it was, became no longer official, but many schools continue to use it. Uh, and the curriculum that came out of that was based on that book too. So we see, you know, we see pieces of that in the school textbook that I was taught Hawaiian history in, through in 2001. Mm. In 2001, my school textbook for Hawaiian history was Gavin Dawes' The Shoal of Time which again, accesses no native voice, mm -hmm. which, you know, and, and so forth. And so it all comes from that foundation. Uh, we're, just changing, we're just making it sound a little nicer as we move along. 
until we start to, 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 to have curriculum uh, written from Kanako, Kanako sources. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, Kumuran, any last um, kind of mana'o or thoughts you want to share with us before we kind of wrap up? Thank you. Well, thank you and thank everybody that's, that's allowed me this opportunity. I, you know, I would really ask folks to, to, to kind of dig deep and, and, and say, you know, is it, time, is it time for me to have the kuleana to do something about this? Mm. Um, there's, to me, there's zero debate anymore um, that's, that, that, the, that, that, that Hawaiian people, that the Kanaka Uivi, that the Hawaiian nation was delighted it was reconfigured into being something horrible. There's, there's so many you know, proofs about that. So if that's true, as a person, as a Christian today, you know, are we not called to do something about that? Uh, mm -hmm. so, so while we root on uh, this principle or that principle or that DOE, or while we complain about this institution, what am I doing? And so mm -hmm. I'd, ask, I would ask each of us to, to, to think about what they're doing. And thank you. Yeah, mahalo for that. And maybe just lastly, I know you've mentioned your book throughout um, kind of this whole time, but is can you remind us of the title and also when and where maybe people can expect that? Sure, it's called Claiming Christianity, uh, The Struggle Over God and Nation in Hawaii. Um, it's going to be a little while because <laughs> publishing is not quick, but hopefully we'll see it within the next 18 months. Okay, excellent. Well, we'll look forward to that. And if people could express their uh, mahalo in the chat for Kumuran, um, we're just really grateful to have you here and for everything that you've so generously shared with us. So mahalo. Aloha. Thank you so much, Kahu Ron. I think um, not just the appreciations that are being shared in the chat today, but I know that through all four of the sessions, I have seen people expressing their deep gratitude for the information that you're sharing. Um, and also their, um, their anger and sadness at um, seeing some of the history and also the joy at seeing what the real position of so many of the Hawaiian churches um, was during the time following the overthrow. Um, thank you so much for all that you have shared with us. Uh, I want to remind people that the next four sessions will be uh, featuring uh, Donova Preza, who will be talking about the land and he will be talking um, initially, I think about the Mahele. So I invite you to be back with us um, next week for our continuing exploration of um, the history of the Hawaiian kingdom and uh, our opportunities to think about what knowing that history means for us today. Again, um, mahalo to Kristen and Cassie for their um, part in making everything work today. And um, best wishes to everyone, um, aloha, have a good rest of your Sunday evening, and we hope to see you back here next week.